Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Griesler. I work here at the Andrusha University for the Network for Political Communication. I'm very happy to see you here today, this morning. Uh, I would like to introduce now a Professor Vice Rector, Dr. Ellen Bose, Professor Dr. Ellen Bose, uh, who, um, who is going to open this event today. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Dear guests, dear friends, dear students, welcome to the Andrashi University Budapest and to the book launch of the Visegrad Four and the Western Balkans Framing Regional Identities. The COVID situation puts the university and its staff into a very challenging, challenging situation. However, as vice rector, I am glad to say that the university has weathered the storm. This was possible thanks to the hard work of its excellent staff. This is the reason that I'm able to welcome you here in this beautiful hall today. I'm very delighted to stand in front of you in a real life setting rather than behind a laptop or a computer. It's rare that live events like this one today can be hosted nowadays. But I believe that we are all missing personal meeting the networking and exchanging ideas, which is such an important activity in our jobs as academics. I'm also very happy to see some students here today in life. Our university opted for online teaching this semester. Some of our new students were not able to travel to Hungary. Others were committed to come and stayed in quarantine. Hopefully, all the students who are based in Budapest have settled somehow, and we can soon resume to a normal teaching schedule. The Andrasi University Budapest is a small and young university, which was established in 2001 by Hungary, Austria, the German Länder Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, and the Federal Republic of Germany. The Andrasi University is the only German-speaking university outside the German-speaking countries. It is a regional cooperation project with the objective to support and maintain the European integration of Hungary and the neighboring states, and to foster German as a scientific language in academic life in Central Europe. The Andrasi University considers itself as an academic joint venture for Hungary and Europe and as an academic bridge for the Danube region. The university offers programs on PhD and master level in four main thematic fields, that's international relations, history, law, and economics. Additionally, joint and double degree programs with several German universities are available. The main research areas of the university with a, region, with a regional focus on the Danube region are European integration processes, political and economic transformation, the quality of democracy, identity formation of nations, cultures, and minorities. So the occasion of this conference is a celebration of the end of a successful project. The university was the leader of this project titled Understanding Identities and Regions, Perspectives on the Reform and Western Balkans. Its main outcome was an edited volume with the title The Visegrad Four and the Western Balkans Framing Regional Identities. Congratulations go to everyone who was involved in the project and to all the authors who contributed to the book and the editors. The book is a very fitting contribution to the research activities of the university. The university is always eager to expand its research networks and to find new partners interested in working with us on current and important topics. 
One previous project, also financed by the International Visegrad Fund, established a network for researchers from the region of the Western Balkans. This Andrashi Forum of Western Balkan Studies is still active in organizing events with a focus on the region. The V4 and the Western Balkans are regular topics in our teaching curriculum and students have an interest to find out more of the political, economic and cultural developments and historical background of these regions. This event will bring the project to an end, but we are confident that other projects will, will follow and more research questions in this area of research will be developed. So as Vice Rector, I am wishing you an interesting event and enjoy your time at our university. I hand over now to the responsible leader of the project, Christina Griesler. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Boos. Thank you, Ellen, for your nice um, introduction and kind words. So we're very pleased to be here today to have this event. And I would like as well to welcome everyone, the guests, the everyone who is watching us live today, friends, colleagues um, who supported us throughout the project. So today's event is um, the final event of this project, which lasted longer than originally planned. It was an 18-month project, but it was extended uh, because of the COVID situation. And um, as Professor Bose already mentioned, it's um, and funded by the International Visegrad Fund, and the title is Understanding Identities uh, and Regions Perspective on the Visegrad Four and the Western Balkans. And what we would like to do today here is um, to launch the book, which now finally came out this summer, and it's the Visegrad Four and the Western Balkan Studies. For our, student, that, our students, that book is in the library already, and it's available online as well. So I hope you have a look uh, uh, for some of the articles, or is this actually of interest for you? So um, before we really start to get into the content of this uh, event and talk more about the aspects of identity and, regional, and regionalism, I would like to thank um, everyone who was involved in putting that um, event together. I think when uh, my colleague um, Adam Balas and I started to work on the organization of this event, we didn't really understand how complex and complicated it can be, you know, <laughs> organizing a live event combined with a, a live streaming and online session. So, but we're very, very happy that we're here today and that you as well joined us for this occasion. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank the technical staff, which is in the back and is supporting us today with, uh, with everything. So, perfect. Thanks very much. Then as well, we have uh, the marketing office looked after the social media campaign. We have an event office who's looking after the venues here and as well is making sure that we have our coffees on time. We have the service office uh, and uh, the team of Ferry Wunsch, who is as well uh, responsible for the technical equipment and in the technical infrastructure here at the university. And then a very, very special thanks goes to Christina Schlachter, who you have all met this morning when coming into the hall. Uh, she is uh, responsible for the project management, so is not only working on this uh, event, but actually um, helping me and supporting me throughout the entire project. And this support was hugely needed, um, and I'm really, really grateful for her for um, all the support. Sometimes as well, psychological support, actually. <laughs> so to keep going, it's not always um, that easy. But uh, so just, you know, we wouldn't be able to be here today if we wouldn't have that huge support of the staff uh, at this university. And then, of course, um, the, for the hard work on the book and the insistence of keeping and improving it and for all your patience, I want to thank Adam Balas, um, who really was uh, there for the last one and a half years, really, you know, uh, helping with getting uh, this book published. And of course, finally, very important, you know, is um, that this is an international Visegrad project. It's the International Visegrad Fund, 
supporting um, this uh, project. And they, were, they have been very flexible as well in helping us to be able to put this um, event together. So thanks uh, to Bratislava as well, to the International Visegrad Fund. So what I would like to do now is after you know, all the thanks, I would like to give you a brief background on the project, how it developed, how the ideas came together, how the research questions emerged throughout the entire process. And then I would like to um, initiating as well a kind of creation or construction of regional identity. And for me, surprising actually was the outcome of that um, conference because the participants, and it was a conference on the Western Balkans, I have to say, the participants concluded that there is no regional identity in the Western Balkans. So this was kind of intriguing and we said, okay, that's, that can't be it. So we have to find out what kind of elements and aspects actually are important to create identity in the region. So we continued from there, uh, and in 2017 we had a conference here at the Andrusha University, um, and we looked at the aspect of religion, language, and education. And then 2018 we went back and had uh, a conference on the political culture, minorities, and gender. The um, issue was that we thought we had brilliant presentations in the context of these kind of conferences and we thought, okay, we should do something with it. You know, this is an expertise we should really gather and uh, try to put into a book. Th then in context with all these kind of organizations uh, um, of these conferences, we thought that we should expand our regional reach and get as well an idea of how regional identity is formed in other regions kind of close by, and we ended up very, it was not, we didn't look too far actually, we ended up um, to look at the Visegrad four countries and see how regional identity, if there is regional identity, developed in the Visegrad four um, countries. So the Visegrad four is a cooperation of four countries that exists since 1991. It was kind of emerging out of the necessity to work together to overcome the economic and political difficulties of the transition period. Um, the aim was actually to, you know, to access the NATO and the European Union. So there was kind of an experience of rather 30 years um, of regional cooperation, and we were kind of thinking, okay, if there was this cooperation taking place, is um, actually, is there a regional um, identity emerging? Um, so we put the two regions in a comparative perspective, or that was the idea, and we put the project proposal in, um, in May 2018 to the International Visegrad Fund with the title Understanding Identities and Regions Perspective on the Visegrad Four and the Western Balkans, and we were happy to get the approval or the project was approved. The partners on that project are uh, still the Center for European Neighborhood Studies at CU, where everything started more or less with our cooperation, or um, then the Institute of Euro European Studies um, at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, the Institute of Political Science at the University of Wroclaw, Faculty of Political Science at the University of Sarajevo, and the Metropolitan University in Prague. And I would like, unfortunately, our partners are not here with us today because of all the kind of uh, travel limitations and restrictions, but I want to thank them here as well for the support of the project and the work with us. And we hope that you know, other projects might emerge um, in future as well. And some of the authors and the partners are going to be in the Zoom session this afternoon, which starts at 2.30. Um, the book was more or less the main objective of that project. And uh, what we um, did, we started uh, to work on the book project in the uh, in organizing two events. So we had the first one at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in, in November 2018, really to get an understanding of what we want to be, um, have in the book and um, how to, what kind of topics would be um, coming up and what the authors wanted to write about. And the second one was um, at the political science faculty in, at the University of Sarajevo in May 2019, where the first drafts of the paper were presented and we you know, we uh, got feedback. And then the entire process of uh, going through articles, peer reviewing, editing, started in the lockdown semester, let's call it that way. 
And now we're here, that's the final event of this project, um, and concluding then the project with the end of the month. What we want to do today is actually um, to, um, we will find out more about the aspects and identity of regional belonging of Slovakia, the case study of Slovakia today. We managed to get our Slovakian colleague over the border yesterday. Um, and um, uh, because this was not really Slovakia, the case study was not really uh, looked at in a separate article in the book. And I think the presentation by Dr. Alexei Kachaski is going to complete, actually, the picture of the Visegrad Four countries in the, in the context of, of the book today. So thanks for uh, being with us and making the journey, which was quite, kind of exciting for everyone, I think, at that stage. Um, and then... Um, we will have as well a book discussion uh, by Sultan Bogaja as well, um, who is going um, to give a, a bit of feedback what's going, what's really going on in the book, and I hope this will kind of as well raise the interest by the students are maybe interested and to have a look at, at what's really in the book. In relation to the Western Balkan case studies in the book, um, we had a kind of a focus on um, the Bosnian Herzegovina, the neighboring countries, and um, uh, Montenegro. And already, kind of, this of selections of case studies revealed the complexity of the issue of identity and, uh, and as well, region, regional cooperation. So, um, and as well, political actors using this kind of identity issues for their own political gains. So, what I quickly want to address, because I'm not sure if I'm running out of time at that stage, but, um, you know, while you're working on those kind of projects and I listen to a lot of your colleagues, some of ideas, some of, some kind of ideas pop up in your head and you just don't know what to do with it. As I said, we had this first conference in 2016 where um, we talked about regional cooperation and regional identity in the Western Balkans and where the conclusion was there is not such a thing as regional identity. Um, and this was kind of intriguing for me because um, um, what, what, not, what was not featured in any of the workshop and conferences and was not featured in the book is this concept of Yugosphere, so the cultural area described as a cultural post-Yugoslavian space where links and traces of the more, more than 40 years existing Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia exists. So what happened to this cultural space? Since the disintegration of Yugoslavia, the countries worked hard to um, develop an own distinct identity, for example, in creating new words and languages, uh, adding letters to, to the language, um, and as well, even sometimes to reinterpret history. Um, and it seems that this lived experience by an entire generation who had gone, you know, experienced life in Yugoslavia, that this is kind of um, erased, that it's, um, but I mean, my assumption is there must be traces left, which is still interest, should be interesting. And what I come across is, first of all, you know, when, we, when you walk, uh, work with people from the area, I mean, they speak a common language. They use a language where they com com can communicate with each other, although it might be having different, different words or there might be differences. As well, if you meet people um, from the region talking about their expat communities in the countries in, in Europe, they always would refer to them as their people. And they're not distinguishing between Serbs, Croats, or Bosniaks. So it's their people. Then. Um, the area of art, culture, and music, so you hear stories about people listening to artists, musicians from the other areas, um, and there is not this kind of distinction of, you know, with what kind of nationality a certain person has. There's kind of an affiliation there. I have one PhD student, she works, for example, on the turbo, mu of turbo folk music, um, which is kind of a cultural space for the second generation of ex-Yugoslavs living in Slovenia. So, however, similarities are not so much in the focus of the narrative um, in the region, it's rather the differences stressed. So it's kind of the similarities are pushed out of the picture and the, the differences are stressed. So maybe we just became accustomed to looking for deaf differences rather than looking at uh, common things, things which we have in common. 
The, so I think that the cultural legacies of Yugoslavia have been a bit ignored or pushed aside. Um, maybe this is a deliberate stra strategy by the politicians so, you know, who want to create newly, new countries with new identities. But um, you know, in the academic discourse, with discourse, we should pick that up and have a, a critical look at that. Um, the second issue is kind of identity and how identity is constructed, which I always uh, find very interesting and intriguing. And that was kind of as well picked up on, in the book. It was a recurring um, issue of the political actors using identity and identity creation for the political gains. Um, so identity is kind of as well in the academic discourse, it's ex extensively used, it's a concept which is kind of in, it's a catchphrase. And I think we have to be more critical when using or talking about identity and look rather on what's, you know, who is constructing identity, how it is constructed, and what's the objective behind the construction of identity. The social identity theory explains the creation of in and out groups um, because the need of the human being to simplify the complex social world surrounding us. So um, we identify you know, who we are, we compare, we create strategy, um, categories, and um, these kind of mechanisms are based on the differences. And then polarized societies, societies in a crisis situation, um, this turns into stereotyping, creating a bias, and as well discriminating. So of course, identity is on complex, consists of a number of aspects and elements, and of course, identities are always transforming. And there is always an internal part to it, so what I am, you know, how, what I feel I am, and then there's the external uh, environment, external actors, defining what I'm supposed to be. Um, so, and this is kind of the difficulty. Who is going to select on, on, on basis of what kind of identity aspects or elements you're in in a, gr in, in a group or outside a group? Um, and the selection of these elements can be arbitrary. Um, and who is going to de determine uh, these kind of the, um, elements? So is then religion or language one of the including aspects or the excluding ones? Is, or what, kind, what, what does gender and social class mean? And we have, for example, the case in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, with the Sejic and Finci case. They're both citizens of, um, the, of Bosnia-Herzegovina, but they're not belonging to any of the groups of the constitu constituent people. That means they fall automatically in the other group. So because you're not a member of one group, you're just ending up in the other group. And that's because the one of, um, is Roma and the other one is a Jewish citizen. Um, the, uh, in 2013, the census actually in, in Bosnia, about 2.73% belong into this other group. So you could say, you can argue, it's not a huge number, but, but I mean, uh, this in-betweenness of people is a personal, it's personally affecting people and can be a problem. Um, so should, wouldn't it be better to, you know, select a separate identity and politics and then look, um, you know, can a citizen not be a citizen independently of rich, religious belief, mother tongue and ethnicity? Um, so is uh, the emphasis on ethnic citizenship and instead of civic citizenship um, still an adequate concept for the Europe of regions? And my last uh, point I want to make is the issue of um, the structure and, and politicians and the difficulty of reforms, especially in the Western Balkans, we have the issue, the, the difficulty that you know, reforms are not taking place. So political structures, social roles and institutions are the ro result of social interaction. The social constructivists tell us that these structures, world views and values are not fixed and can be changed. So an actor is able to influence and can modify structures, rules, regulations. Political and social reform, overcoming differences, you know, finding agreements to kind of social uh, problems, um, they can be found if there's a political will. But I mean, in some of the cases uh, at the moment, it looks like it's more beneficial for political actors to remain with the current um, structures um, and to reaffirm actually the existing structures than changing it, because changing the political structures can actually undermine the political power. 
But, uh, you know, to end this with a positive development, I think the EU has for a long time supported as well civil society um, activities and uh, as well as part of the democratization process. And civil society cooperation in the region consists of a network of NGOs, and I think we can appreciate, we know how important NGOs are as well here in this region. Um, and uh, I think these NGOs pick up topics which the politicians still try to avoid, such as reconciliation, coping with the past, establishing facts about the atrocities in the war in the 1990s. And quite recently, a regional youth cooperation office was established to support the exchange of young people in the region and to foster a new generation of young leaders or maybe political leaders. And uh, let's hope that these young leaders are much more focusing on the similarities than on the differences. And um, I would like to conclude with that and uh, hope you had, uh, it was kind of interesting for you. And I'm wishing you all an interesting conference, some fruitful discussions, and I would like to hand over now to Dr. Um, Adam Benzebolas. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you for joining this live event in person or via streaming. It's great to be here. And before I start, let me thank the Visegrad Fund for their substantial support. And let me express my gratitude for, to the András University for hosting this event, especially the life part in these hard times. I know that this requires courage trust, and I'm fully aware that it engages serious responsibility. So once again, it's great to be here with you at this live event. And before continuing introducing um, some of the day's main topics, let me thank personally and publicly you, Christina, for your diligence, your reliability, and most of all for your trust throughout this long, difficult, and sometimes desperate process called book editing. It's great to be here, but it wasn't easy to get here um, to this region, Hungary, Budapest, concentric circles. Once again, Europe is fractured. The European space where our two regions belong to is fragmented. There is a security issue. The same for all of us. But different countries react in different ways, following their sometimes unclear priorities and following their habits, not necessarily the best ones. I'm not discussing the pandemic part. I seize it as an occasion to think through the current state or condition of the continent in terms of unity, in terms of differences, and regarding the very European space where we live, and concerned with uh, the pre-existing tendency, so it's something that uh, didn't start uh, this year, I'm afraid, the pre-existing tendency to give up our mobility in the name of security and for the sake of our security. Stay where you are, right now this sounds good. So right now, it makes sense to say within um, rather narrow borders. The problem is that stay where you are easily shifts into stay as you are, be who you are told to be, imitate the stereotype. Today, it's wash your hands like on the little picture. Tomorrow, it will be put your washed hand on your heart during the national anthem like on the little picture. So that's what I'm concerned with. The virus doesn't want anything, but this absurd episode has to make some sense. It has to make sense, and it will only have the sense and meaning we are willing to give it. So we have a common narrative. It's a threat. So it's a security narrative. But the result is not cooperation. The result is a labyrinth in this European space, and different countries take this common security narrative 
and use or abuse it in different ways. So I'm not annoying you with the virus, I'm actually annoying you with the next security issue that will come. And I think that this situation right now is a major warning. It is on the global level. It's also a major warning on the tiny European level. And for us, it might be a warning that the idea of fortress Europe is a pipe dream. So the idea of an internal European space surrounded by thick and tough external borders uh, should guarantee free circulation inside of the European space. And what we see now is that is the perfect opposite of that. It leads to fragmentation, it leads to a labyrinth. So this might be a warning if we are willing to give it such a political sense. The other major warning on our tiny European level is that we need better maps. In a labyrinth, we are lost, we don't see our situation, we don't know anything about our location, and we only see the small part where we are lost, in fact. We need better maps, and what we see now, following this metaphor, like every time there's a situation, not even a crisis, just a situation, the map we see is the map of national standpoints. So it's a map, it's the map of the Europe of nations once again, which is an avoidable reality. Nations are here to stay. We can think of other um, smaller or larger structures, but the current standard, if I may, the currency is the nation state. Question is, is this the only map? Is it an exclusive map, like extremes a bit everywhere in Europe often harshly demand? Which is a bit strange to demand a Europe of nations because that's exactly what we live in, a Europe of nations. Um, are there other maps? So is it an exclusive one? For instance, regional maps coming to the topic. Regional maps, not to replace national maps, but to complete them. To complete them in order to get a better view, more perspective, better means of orientation in the labyrinth. In order not to be stuck in predetermined corners of the labyrinth. I mentioned extremes, and mainstream extremes unfortunately bring me to East Central Europe and Southeastern Europe, more precisely to the Visegrad Four and the Western Balkans. These are two very different regions despite their proximity. One is in the EU, the other would like to be. One is very proud to call itself, with quite some exaggeration, Central Europe. The other one has been given the name Western Balkans and it's a quite stigmatizing level. And here we find this problem is that how to define regional identity now that the Yugosphere seems to be a bit canceled. Um, so that's another difference, but there is a common point. There's more than one common point. The common point is that in both regions, the national narratives are quite explicit and exclusive. Another common point is that, proud or not, proudly Central European or forced into the Western Balkan label, both regions have quite a reputation in Europe. And the V4 is more preoccupying on the European scene because precisely it's part of the EU. It has been integrated to the EU. Now, a word on integration, integration can mean basically two things. It can be enlargement, and it can be deepening, cohesion with another word. Now, enlargement is easier to grasp, to understand on the map of nation states. You have nation states, and you add other nation states to a pre-existing group. That can be followed on the map of nations. Now, deepening cooperation, cohesion, now that's a bit more complicated, especially on a map of nations, because deepening 
is not exclusively international. It's a multi-level process, and here we see that when we talk about regional realities, it's not only one circle, it's not only one dimension. Take, for instance, border regions. Take the border region between Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. What kind of place area is that? Is it a micro region? Is it a local territory? Well, it's a bit of everything, because to make such a place work, with the border not um, uh, at its limits, but at the very heart of it in a slightly contradictory way, you do need cooperation between nation states, the three of them, but you do need also the whole European construction around them in which they are embedded. So you do need a local, uh, level, you do need the regional one, which is in this case Central European, and you do need the European one. So it's a bit of all of these together. And this might be one way to think regional cooperation a bit further. So not to stick to the map in the sense that, okay, one region, macro region equals these three or four or more countries. Now, this multi-level process of deepening is probably a test of maturity for European member states. And it seems that at least a part of the Visegrad 4, at least a part, got somehow mentally stuck between a successful enlargement process, ended in 2004, and the many possibilities and challenges of further deepening. Coming back to enlargement, Chances are that the V4, perhaps uh, not on purpose, the V4 are blocking the Western Balkans joining the EU. We have a great chapter in the book, a media analysis on how the V4 appears in the Czech media by Andre Daniel. Now, this research should be extended to, you, to the European media, how the V4 appears in Western European media, among others, and what does it translate? And the problem is, my bitter hypothesis uh, at least, is that the V4, undoubtedly a region in Europe, has become the name of a region against Europe. Why does it block the Western Balkans? Do we think that uh, Western Europe is eager to integrate countries that might cease to be European or, or at least act uh, European right after joining. So whatever V4 political leader standpoint is on the Western Balkans, fact is that among others founding members of the EU do not necessarily wish to repeat 2004 and its failures. So this is one connection between these two neighboring regions beyond political discourse in particular. So let me come to the main question for the V4, which will be um, this afternoon's first panel. It's a very simple question. What's wrong with us? Not with you, not with them, us and not us in the usual and honestly quite boring us and them um, combination, us in the inclusive sense of an enlarged regional community. Let's ask this question on the regional level. How come that we, some of us believe that the EU is about having one specific political standpoint like in one circle? Like in one hemisphere, it makes sense to have standpoints, but on the European level, we are moving between, shifting between concentric circles. These are not exclusive, and these are not against each other. The regional level, regional cooperation is not meant to be against the continental level and continental cooperation. These are not against each other. It's a matter of shifting from one to the other. It's not about just one or the other. Um, 
political standpoint, besides the EU, is not that united. It's not united enough to, to have like one standpoint, one point of view, one opinion on things. So I'm afraid, once again, it's a sort of uh, chimera. Another question inside of this, what's wrong with us? If the V4 is such a united front, um, then where are, for instance, the common or shared history textbooks? between, for instance, Slovakia and Hungary. Not identical ones, because once again, the standard is still the nation state. Shared ones that would complete each other, textbooks, not only in history, but also in literature, textbooks that agree on the facts, but propose different points of view on the agreed facts and events. Where are these? Other question. In the V4, in East Central Europe, do we really know each other? How well do we know each other? How much do I know about Slovakia, for instance? I'm very much looking forward to learn something at last about Slovakia soon, because I'm afraid that we don't know that much about these neighboring countries. And often, I'm afraid, when Central Europe or the V4 is mentioned, it tends to be a more extrapolation of a national experience of the national situation. Where is our legend? And the privilege of East Central Europe was to experience that process of becoming Europeans within a reasonably short lapse of time which other reason, regions more to the east and more to the south, especially with the Yugoslav wars, couldn't experience. We had this privilege, and now we are at the other end. We are blocking um, not only further enlargement, but we are also showing tempting but very negative examples to Western Europe because our countries, some of our countries, not only show that such regimes are possible, what we are showing is that this is possible in the EU. So that would be on the V4 to announce this afternoon's um, first panel. Let me come to the Western Balkans for a second set of comments and opening questions. We have focused in our book on regions to try to add another map to uh, the map of nations. Uh, so something that might transcend the usual nationalistic patchwork and its local shortcomings. So let's try to enlarge things. Let's try to think through our own shortcomings on another level. And the region was this concentric circle halfway between the national or local and the continental. The problem is that there is an optical illusion stemming from this. When we focus too much on regions, the optical illusion is that Europe is the big picture, that Europe is the largest concentric circle. Good morning. We are in 2020. Europe is not the big picture anymore. Europe is somewhere in the big picture and is the current challenge to, um, to decide, to see, to understand what the exact place and the exact role of Europe on the global scene is. Somewhere in the big picture. And my idea here on the Western Balkans is that how to connect Europe to this big picture, and it might make sense to make further research on the regional level, because precisely the regional level might connect to the global scene better than the continental one, or at least to complete it. Let me give you an example. We remember the wars in Yugoslavia. Those happened in the 90s. Now, in the Western media, whenever you read something about Srebrenica, for instance, it's always the same phrase coming back and back, it's always, we would have never thought that this could be possible in Europe again. In Europe. So the only perspective on the Balkan Wars of the 90s 
is basically 1945 in the European context. Now let me enlarge this perspective. Those wars happened on the same global scene than other conflicts in the world, just to name a few. The Congo, Rwanda, civil war in Algeria, Chechnya. This is, all of this happened on one global scene. Now I know that Europeans, many Europeans, don't necessarily like the idea of being compared to non-European conflicts. Even if it's about our bloodiest wars, we do not like to be compared to something that seems seen from here as a tribal uh, black African conflict. But fact is that all this happened on the scene that emerged uh, after the end of the Cold War. The difference between the 90s and now is that now we have a better view on this global scene, even though this global scene has a complexity that doesn't always seem to make sense. Perhaps it doesn't. Hence the, uh, hence the idea of thinking through it instead of simplifying it like many of our demagogues do, they simplify something or they give sense to something that's far too complex to make sense. Let's try to focus on the regional level and see to, com to compare, not necessarily in a very you know, tight way, these different conflicts because there's a common denominator between these conflicts that I just listed. They were all regional conflicts. They all involved regional powers, great powers, at least for a, for a certain lapse of time. And then they got forgotten. Algeria after the civil war, Bosnia-Herzegovina after the civil war. In the limelight for a couple of years and then disappeared completely from the media, forgetting. So the idea here is that the regional, understanding the regional level might be a way to better connect Europe to this global context because we are really, we have really reached a defining moment. So the impulse for European integration, I mentioned 1945, indeed comes from, is built on a disaster and is getting somewhat exhausted. So this this willingness, this impulse to build Europe, to enlarge it, to deepen it. Now we see a bit the, some opposite um, symptoms. And we are in a world, a post-colonial world, which is not meant to be Eurocentric anymore. So of course, when I list different conflicts, of course that the Bosnian war is more important for me. It's closer, there are historical, cultural, every reason that I feel it, it, emotionally speaking, it's much closer to me than any of the other conflicts I listed, but that's not the question. The question is not to make them even and to pretend that these are uh, all one and the same or that one is more important than the other. What we have to see is that all of this is happening in uh, the same common reality. And to focus on the regional level, look around in the world, read the newspapers. This might be one of the most urgent contemporary issues around the world, from the current armenian Azeri situation to the Middle East, which are connected because it's the same regional powers that are in conflict there. These are regional conflicts. And we have this European experience, unfortunately, but we do have the European experience in the Balkans to know how such conflicts works and how to prevent them or at least try to overcome those that are already happening. A short set of last set of short comments on identity. I mentioned uh, the idea of staying where we are and staying as we are and being what we are told we are. Now that's the exact opposite of become who you are, to become yourself. Not to stay what you are told that you were determined to be, but to become. 
And I'm afraid that the identitarian vocabulary is unable to translate um, these processes. Becoming is linked to mobility. To become, you have to travel. There is movement in becoming. You don't become what you are by staying where you are. And concerning the V4, the idea is not to become something else than we are. To the Hungarians in the room, we will never be Austrians. I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but we will never be Austrians, and that's not the aim. The aim is to become Hungarians. The aim is to become Central Europeans, and the aim is to become Europeans, because these are supposed to mean one and the same thing. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Adam, for your uh, presentation. So we still have time, or we have a lot of time, actually, for Q&A, questions and answers. So um, the setup is I have a microphone here, which I can um, give you if you have any questions. Uh, and we are going to turn around so that we can actually um, answer um, the questions. Um, please feel free to ask if anything was unclear. Um, then uh, we, uh, you know, we hope to clarify um, issues. And then only after that we have a coffee break <laughs> because we had a, a slight change in the program. So we will have the Q&I and then uh, a coffee break and then we continue. Thanks very much. Okay, second. Yeah. Should I stand up or? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you for very interesting presentations. I'm looking forward to the debate. Uh, I have more of a comment, actually. Um, I, I don't know much about your research project, which had to do with the Western Balkans, um, but I found it interesting that you actually expected um, uh, that that particular construct will evoke some sort of shared identity, because to me, the Western Balkans is something which is, uh, you know, externally. Uh, externally imposed on that region. I mean, it's the gaze of, of I don't know what, international institutions, uh, external players. So, um, I mean, I would not even suspect that, 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 that there would be something under that particular label. Of course, there are other things that are shared across the region, but I just thought it was interesting that you expected to find something. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks for the question. I think um, it's maybe from an outsider's perspective to, um, you know, because I'm an, I'm an outside of the region, and I mean, I grew up still with Yugoslavia in existence, and we always, you know, went to um, Yugoslavia for holidays. So maybe because at the time, or during my life, it was very much constructed as a space with a lot of similarities. And you might not question it, and I think this is exactly it. I think it's kind of, you know, why Srebrenica was suddenly in Europe, and now the Western Balkans are no longer in Europe. You know, this is kind of, you know, always the perspective and always how, how it's phrased and who is deciding what part is in and what part is out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, who knows what is in Europe and what isn't. <laughs> exactly. So I think, and for me, it was kind of, there's too many similarities for me in the Western Balkans, except, okay, we have the Albanian community, of course, which are kind of, uh, you know, very distinct, maybe from the Slavic uh, speaking um, uh, communities in, in the region, but we can say the same about the Hungarians in the Visegrad countries, you know. I mean, why do the Hungarians feel that much included in the Visegrad cooperation? They, you know, have kind of different traits. Because Visegrad is in Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so it's, um, uh, but it was kind of, I mean, you understand that there are always, I mean, and we talk about regions you know, regions consisting of several um, states or even parts of states, you know, this, uh, larger regions, but there are the smaller, the micro regions. So there might, you know, the different regions within the countries of the Western Balkans. And, you know, they may have um, specific specificities and um, specialities, and now they are more leveled up to the national level. So this is now Croatian, and this is Serbian. 
and then um, you wonder, you know, is it that specific for this country or, you know, we had this, uh, the cucumbers here from Slovakia and yeah. Hungary, you know, you know, is it now typical Hungarian or typical Slovak, you know, or maybe then the Austrians come in and have, a, you know, have their cucumbers as well. So it's kind of, um, I don't know, I, I was kind of maybe surprised at the time that it was, that there was not really any thought about it, you know, what we have in common. So there was kind of in saying, no, no, we know we have, you know, the Croatians developed their own language and, and Serbs have their own approach to stuff. So, and that, that was coming from a young, younger generation of people um, from the region. I think it kind of surprised me because I thought there must still something be left there, something. And, you know, sp speaking in the same language, I thought it's kind of interesting that the, the identity is so much based now on the differences and looking for the differences rather than saying, you know, but there is some kind of uh, something uh, which, um, you know, brings us together or gives us a kind of even mental map which we can refer to coming from a region. And still you have this kind of situation when I was talking to a lady in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and she realized I was from Vienna and she was like, oh yeah, yeah, there's so many of our people there. You know, every time I go to Vienna, I meet my people. And I was like, okay, who are your people now? You know, is it a certain specific? But it was kind of this, this you know, the community. Um, and the, this is kind of for me fascinating. So therefore I, I thought this kind of, just maybe not addressing the, 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 the elements which are uh, people from the region have in, in common. But this is maybe an outsider's perspective, but I think something to discuss and look into. Okay. Any other Add something or? So sorry about this arrangement. It's not that easy in COVID times. So. Thank you for this question. Um, the main, main thing is to see how we can articulate um, regional phenomenon to the very idea of identity. And what we see in successful regions is that precisely regional cooperation is much more immanent than identity issues. So we mentioned uh, yesterday and today the these uh, border regions. Border regions just work, people commute, people just don't have the time to wonder who am I and who do I hate as, uh, as who I am. So here it's precisely the regional level that might override or transcend identity issues. So the, the question of is there a regional identity in this or that region is not necessarily an exclusive question. There might be other connections between region and identity. You are perfectly right <clears throat> to be pessimistic about the Western Balkans. Does it mean anything? The question is normative. So indeed, it's very hard to describe things in terms of regional identity because it's a very complex region. Is it a region at all? It's a bit the rest of Europe. So all those who are not in the European Union, in the book, by the way, we had to make a choice, which was to leave Albania and the Albanian part of the Western Balkans out for the very simple reason that it's a completely different story. So we focused on the Yugoslav brothers and sisters, leaving even Macedonia out because there it's a bordering region, it's, uh, it's already part of the Albanian realm, so here there is something more normative than descriptive, if you will. So let's see how to improve regional co cooperation <clears throat> in the Western Balkans to, to forget with time about these identity issues, which is not an easy challenge, I have to admit. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, rather give one comment uh, to uh, you, Adam. I would not, uh, how to say, um, although I 
agree with many of the statements you gave. I would not put away with the state level um, in a, let's say, one cut way, because to paraphrase the constructivist um, paradigm, basically the state's policy is what the state makes out of the national policies in the sense that I would say if there is a political elite in a state, in a given state, to cooperate, then uh, a lot is possible also on the regional level. To give you two examples, uh, I grew up in a border region in Austria bordering Switzerland and Germany. And although Switzerland has not joined the EU, uh, there has been a very uh, extensive uh, exchange and cooperation in the border region uh, over the last 20 years, as it was always before also. Good, I agree, there is a cultural proximity between these three countries because of the shared language and so on. But there is also a political will uh, that uh, it is normal to cross the border from one country to the other. Or a second example, a positive example in COVID times is we all heard that Sweden uh, was, if you want, uh, stigmatized to a certain degree because of the more liberal policy towards COVID uh, by other states. So uh, the travel restrictions were uh, uh, countered by citizens that uh, southern, people who wanted to go to southern Sweden, to Malmö or Gothenburg, they just crossed the border to Denmark and then flew out of Copenhagen to wherever they wanted to go. So there was a kind of, let's say, a spirit in these two countries to counter restrictions. And I think it is not by accident that, for example, people from Seget do not have the idea to spend a shopping day in Temeshwar or a shopping day in Novi Sad, although it is, I think, maybe one hour away by car, which is a reality in all the border regions. A Milanese goes to uh, Ticino, a uh, person from St. Gallen in Switzerland certainly travels to Austria or to Germany for shopping. That's something, an everyday reality. So I just reinforce my thought. Uh, the mind frame of the political uh, decision maker at the state level is important and is perhaps, as you also um, said, is at the moment the most decisive level. You rather stress the disadvantages I perhaps wanted to bring uh, these positive examples also. Thank you from Western Europe. Thank you for your feedback and for bringing a positive example into our context. Now, the fact that the, the state, as you say, is the, is the standard and everything depends on, 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 on will, that's the main problem probably with the Visegrad 4 is that it's a very loose cooperation and it changes according to following uh, current governments. So the V4, it can, be, it can mean a lot, as that it can be nothing. So that's indeed a problem. And here, uh, the national level or the state level is indeed unavoidable. Now, you, uh, you underlined a very important notion for um, our identity issues and its mobility. So the fact that in the positive examples you gave, people are moving, people are traveling, they are going from one place to the other. And mobility is indeed a concept to perhaps to rethink and to redefine, because mobility doesn't mean that you have to go far away, like commuting between a suburb and downtown. I wouldn't call that mobility. Mobility is about the fact that you can go wherever you want, 
and that you are willing to. And it's almost, um, it's more than a contrasting notion with what I try to define as identity, as a fixed something. How can we um, override these identitarian issues? How can we transcend identitarian thinking without mobility? Question is how to reach um, uh, that level. So such positive examples. Switzerland is a positive example. Switzerland is not today's topic. I'm not that convinced of uh, the way Switzerland relates to the European Union because it profits of it without taking any responsibility. It has all the advantages but is never there when there is a problem. So I would be a bit careful with the Swiss um, example. And besides, the Swiss and especially the Scandinavian examples are usually far too perfect to be followed by normal countries. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Just a comment as well. Um, it was kind of um, telling because uh, in spring, when the first lockdown happened, that slowly, slowly opening up the borders again. I mean, it was kind of, you know, the, even between Austria and Hungary, it became very clear that you can't shut the border really that tight. And then um, the, it, was, it was the Central Five, I think, came together. Central Five was actually Austria, Slovenia, um, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, and Hungary. And they were kind of creating this group uh, that didn't last long, actually, but um, ex exactly to talk about how can we manage the borders in the time of crisis. So kind of really showing a willingness to come together and uh, to um, um, ensure that this kind of, you know, this, this link which is there between the population and this necessity, you know, having people commuting um, between different countries is going to be made easier. And it was kind of, you know, it was kind of, shown off the, uh, the foreign minister, I think, was even here in, in Hungary, the Austrian one, uh, kind of you know, celebrating that this is, was achieved and there's a political will is, willingness there and the next time it will be different. And remember, we had a meeting at the end of August to talk about this event, and I think it was on this day when they just decided to close the borders on the 1st of September. And I think the Central Five doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> so I haven't heard anything about this. So there might be willingness at a certain period of time, it looks good, you just have the social media marketing campaign, whatever, and then suddenly a political decision, it's just one political decision can undermine those kind of um, developments. And it's kind of, you know, what should the population think about then, um, in, you know, how to deal with it, because we still, I mean, we have students here, and I know had the first lecture in the morning asking, you know, where they are and how they are. A lot of students were still in Germany, didn't come. Uh, a lot of students, or you know, there were the eager students who really wanted to come to Hungary. They ended up in quarantine for two weeks. So, um, but we're still glad that the students are here now, uh, at least some of them. And uh, we hope that uh, you know we can uh, have more of these events in, in future. But I mean, this political will willingness can be over very quickly, and you know, no one was really uh, counting on that. So this is just another comment. Okay, is there, can be comments or can be questions? So we take uh, any ideas um, before we go to the coffee break. We still have a bit of time. Or is networking more the idea? Okay, is there? Ah, is there more? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I don't know, I have a question. Um, in how far do you think um, can you combine regional identity to European identity? Because I think, um, like, um, seeing the example of the Brexit, um, like, we get conscious that the European cooperation is not something, I mean, it can be broken, so it's not, like, um, uh, super, totally extreme stable. And, um, like, in the conclusion of this, do you think that, um, like, 
I don't know, um, to um, support regional identity, to create regional identity, can it harm European identity? Or um, seeing it the different way, um, is creating, a, like try to create European identity harmful for regional identity? Or I don't know if I get my point across. No. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's indeed one of the, the great issues. Um, these identities, if we uh, formulate the question in identitarian terms, are not supposed to be against each other. So, in my view, being European and belonging to a region within Europe are not you know, excluding each other. The idea of regional cooperation might be to have, you know, um, uh, co cooperation with, uh, with countries that are alike and to have this choice. So Europe is, well, it's not really big, but still there is room inside of it. And usually the countries that, um, that cooperate in a reinforced way are neighboring countries. So you can take um, uh, Scandinavian countries, at least those who are in the EU, the Benelux. So we have these cooperation. So it's not a rule, it's not a theory, it's a bet that r countries that are alike, and this is how we are supposed to be in East Central Europe, will be more willing to work together and might understand each other uh, better than, than, let's say, the Western end and the Eastern end of uh, the European Union. However, this is not a necessity. We are not doomed to one, um, one region for cooperation. So I think that there is much more potential in the European Union, but still, one of the priorities, one of the main priorities, especially in East Central Europe, and then let's not even mention the Western Balkans, it's about reconciliation between neighbors. So this is what regional cooperation should be about. This is what your regional cooperation should help to, because, well, there are problems already in East Central Europe, but when in a region where there was war uh, in the 90s, it's, it's another issue. So once again, just let me repeat it. I'm not sure that uh, it's a good idea to always talk about these things in identitarian terms. So let's just see that we have different concentric circles. There is the local one, the national one, the regional one, and the continental one. If you start to think about it in terms of who am I, where do I belong, and against whom are we, then these questions are triggered. We don't have to. It's not necessary. That would be. Yeah, it's an interesting question and a quite uh, often asked questions because we, if we want to develop a European identity, do we have to give up another identity? And I don't think so. I mean, when you travel abroad, it depends where you are. You know, when you go to South Africa, for example, and someone asks where you're from, you know, then you start off with, you know, I'm European, I'm from Europe. And that still, you know, then they might know, you know, where Europe is, and then they ask, so where, which country in Europe? And then you go into your country, or even on a regional level, you know, if you meet an Austrian and say, yeah, yeah, I'm Austrian, and then they will ask, you know, because you identify with a certain region where you grew up. And identity has this kind of different layers, and um, I mean, We've, you know, I feel European because I've lived in European countries now for a while, in different European countries for a while. So, you know, this maybe the Austrian patriotism is gone a bit, you know, but still I'm Austrian. It's written on my passport. I'm not going to deny it, but maybe the, the priority or preference is kind of changing. And I, I think, you know, it's important for me to be European as well, but because it has a meaning, it has a value um, as well. 
Um, so, I mean, identities are shifting, priorities, you know, what you think you are, kind of how you define yourself um, is, is changing. And as well, I mean, at the other side, we here at this university will look very much on, you know, do research, conduct research in the Danube region. And we quite often ask then, you know, do you have an identity as a citizen of the Danube region or are you a Danube, you know, person? And to be honest, no. You know, I know that Danube goes through Austria and Vienna, Vienna and Budapest and, you know, you see Danube every day, but this is another concept. I cannot relate with the Danube region that much. So, you know, it's not my choice of identity. So, and I think, um, you know, we need to have this flexibility in mind. I think you can be European, you can be German, you can be Hungarian. Um, and, um, and you can be, you know, from um, a certain region uh, or sub-region. Um, just kind of a bit of flexibility, open-mindedness, and, and, and just um, not to be too much focusing on one layer of identity, but you have this fluid identity. And I think the European Union, I mean, uh, you know, it was hard enough for them to create this European identity, uh, but I mean, there are so symbols we now identify with Europe, and we have a European flag, and we have, a, you know, the, the music, and we have, you know, Erasmus. I mean, Erasmus was the best thing, you know, um, to invent ever, this kind of regional exchange programs. Um, and this is kind of uh, very, um, you know, this kind, can create identity. And I think it's a personal choice then what you make out of it. Okay, so if there are any comments or other questions, we can take one before the break. Or there is rather the feeling. Okay, then we go into the coffee break. Good. Okay. Then I hope the coffee is already ready because we're a bit early. So um, the coffee is in the other room. Uh, and take the possibility to talk, you know, talk to each other, the students, to get to know each other. And it's really a pleasure to have the students here today. So enjoy yourselves here and have a nice coffee. Thanks. Back, everyone. I hope you had time to enjoy the coffee and uh, exchange ideas uh, and uh, talk to each other a bit. So welcome you back to the second part of this morning sessions. And as I promised in my uh, presentation, we could try, um, we tried love and as well um, working at the Charles University in Prague. And his um, research uh, interests are based in uh, identity aspects and uh, as well international relations um, of um, Slovakia. So um, we're very happy to have you here. Um, and we're eager to learn more and find out more about Slovakia now in the next hour. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is a territory of freedom. You can take off your mask and say whatever you want. Um, um, hello, um, thank you, Christina, for this um, nice introduction. Just a minute. I'm very happy to be here, um, not only because, yes, the crossing of the border was uh, very interesting, but also because the, it's a very splendid environment here in the palace. Um, it's even a bit intimidating, I would say. It's too, too beautiful. Um, but um, yeah, I will try not to be uh, intimidated. Um, so. Uh, I'm here to um, fill in a gap of sorts, um, talk, talking about Slovakia um, as um, an important part of uh, the V4 grouping and the larger Central and Eastern European region. Um, what you're seeing, and I hope you can see this with the lights off, um, what you're seeing is the, the Devin Castle um, in Bratislava. Um, it's a very spectacular sight, but it's also um, kind of symbolic because um, this is the um, those cross-border regions that um, Adam was talking about already. Um, you see here, this is Slovakia, this is in Slovakia, and this is Austria, right? So the kind of uh, regional border. 
um, I thought this would be a perfect um, illustration of regionalism in this case. Um, yeah, um, so I'm going to build my argument around the idea of um, Slovakia being uh, an outlier or a strange case, if you will, uh, but an outlier uh, in more than one sense, right? So we can roughly divide this into the ne negative and positive outliers. And it is a highly interesting case, uh, even though um, it is, you know, it tends to be uh, absent from mental maps uh, sometimes, um, which I think the experience of this particular research project also somehow uh, demonstrated. But um, somebody who's from another country, something I forgot to mention that I'm not Slovak, uh, although I've lived in Slovakia for uh, many years, and it's a strange thought that I've lived in Slovakia longer than anywhere else in my life. I would never thought they would come to that. Um, but as somebody who comes um, from another country, which also tends to be um, absent from mental maps, I can totally empathize with, with Slovakia in that respect and in, in many other respects. So um, let me turn to popular culture. The first time I ever heard about the Slovaks it was many, many years ago. I mean, that was long before um, I moved um, to Slovakia and studied there. Um, it was in my teenage years. I was reading a novel, um, which you all very well know. Uh, it was a novel by Bram Stoker um, called Dracula. So um, if you remember how it starts, if you read it, uh, it starts with a journey um, from Vienna to Budapest, which is still spelled with a hyphen. This is the end of the 19th century. And uh, you see there kind of a, you know, an, a very orientalist, orientalist um, take um, of the narrator. So it feels like leaving the West and entering the East uh, once you cross the border into the um, Hungarian part of um, the empire. And of course, this immediately uh, evokes uh, Larry Wolf, the idea that you travel 10 centuries back uh, when you cross the border into the so-called Eastern Europe. So there's a general Orientalism um, in, in that novel. But also there's a reference to, to the Slovaks. Um, and and uh, this, is what, um, this is what it looks like in uh, Bram Stoker's text. They're the strangest figures that we saw in that Oriental environment. Um, they are more but barbarian than everybody else. That's how uh, Stoker depicts the Slovaks. Um, so uh, this wasn't only my first um, image that I got many, many years ago as, as a teenage reader of the Slovaks. Um, apparently, uh, this is the first, if not the first one, but then one of the first ones, one of the first images in Western popular culture that, that Slovakia, uh, um, you know, that Slovakia received uh, one of the first depictions. And I remember how this was discussed at um, a conference organized by the Slovak Foreign Ministry. Uh, it was a conference on public diplomacy and the image of, of Slovakia in the West. And they said, you know what? We, we found this passage from uh, Bram Stoker. <laughs> Do you know it? I said, yes, I, I know it. <laughs> I read it many years ago. Um, wh why am I talking about this? Well, uh, because um, a lot of the discussion um, that was taking place, um, that, that was um, a lot of the discussion in the book um, uh, had to do with the relationship between um, uh, the region uh, or the regions in the plural, um, the V4, uh, Central Europe and the Western Balkans and the Western other. Right? Um, so this is the gaze, as they say, of the Western other. Um, one of the possible, you know, ways. Um, one of the possible images, um, and uh, that image, 
the strangest figures that we saw uh, might just might have something to do with um, um, the idea of um, of uh, Slovakia being an outlier, right? Uh, a kind of a laggard, um, you know, uh, a nation that has fallen behind uh, other nations, even uh, spoken from a regional perspective. But that's just one uh, sense in which it can be seen as an outlier. Uh, like I said, there are two outliers here. Um, so switching from popular culture to, um, to a bit of history, just to understand the context, um, we'll talk a bit about the historical context of um, Slovak um, nation formation, uh, formation of national identity. So um, there are a couple of, uh, there's a couple of important points here. Um, and um, you will, or Czechia as they, they now decided to call it, but I can never get used to that um, term. I can't believe I even pronounced it. Um, so the first thing to start with, the most obvious thing to start with is of course that historically, um, if we look at the 19th century uh, context, um, and and and, uh, and earlier, there is no territorial entity uh, in which um, Slovak nation building could be anchored. Uh, if you compare that to, let's say, Poland, uh, with a tradition of the Polish kingdom, or Hungary with a tradition of Hungarian kingdom, which is more or less territorially delineated, um, then you see a problem here. Um, you cannot anchor. Um, Slovak nation, national identity in, in, in a particular uh, territory, nor um, in a set of historical political institutions, like the Kingdom of Hungary, for example, right? Um, or or uh, Polish Kingdom, or even the, the Czech lands, the lands of the Czech crown, right? Which is also a historical tradition of statehood. So the Slovaks, um, um, in that sense, were um, in a, in a rather unfavorable position because uh, they could not anchor uh, their national identity building in a, in a problem with that, of course, being that Central Europe tends to be rather mixed ethnically. Right? So it's very difficult to delineate um, an ethnic territory uh, exactly because um, Central Europe is quite multicultural. Right? Um, another important aspect is, of course, was that it wasn't just an ethnic, an ethnic group, but it was an endangered ethnic group, right? Uh, so as um, in particular, in the second half of the 19th century, as the Kingdom of Hungary was trying to uh, reinvent itself uh, to um, change the multicultural, multinational kingdom into a mono-ethnic Hungarian state. And uh, uh, the Slovak ethnic was supposed to be uh, material for that, if you will, um, which of course um, uh, put it at uh, a direct danger of being assimilated. <laughs> As um, one Slovak diplomat who used to work in Hungary once said during a discussion, um, if it wasn't for 1914 um, and uh, if it wasn't for the breakup of the uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, we, the Slovaks, would not exist by this point. Uh, we would be, uh, he said, something like some kind of folklore group, uh, songs and dances from the Tatra Mountains or something like that. We would be, you know, purely kind of, um, um, purely would be a remnant of, 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 of an ethnic. There would be some local ethnographic differences, but we would be uh, abolished as, as uh, an ethnic if the, the assimilation processes were to continue. Um, another important aspect, which of course is also related to the Slovak experience in, in the Kingdom of Hungary, in Austria-Hungary, is um, a very strong pan-Slavic or pan-Slavist influence which I would dare argue uh, played a constitutive role in uh, Slovak national, national identity building. Right? So uh, pan-Slavism 
and Russophilia, uh, seeing as uh, the experience with Austria, Austria-Hungary and the Slovak national revival of looking up to, to Russia as, a, as an imagined leader of the Slavic world, as the only Slavic state at some point, uh, the only independent Slavic state. Uh, and uh, this is um, a tradition of uh, being skeptical, critical, um, um, critical of, of uh, Austria-Hungary and of the West um, in general. So Ludovic, Ludovic Stur, the uh, father of uh, standard Slovak and um, a kind of iconic figure of uh, the Slovak national revival, would compare the West uh, uh, to a chariot, which is uh, sort of racing, rushing to the precipice, that the West is morally decadent. It is, uh, its last days are coming. Uh, but the new future is, is in Russia. It's in the East. It's with all the Slavic nations, not with the Western world. Um, but uh, with the Russian Tsar and um, Slavdom, which is the world of the future, uh, the title of um, Stor's book. Um, so there's a strong pan-Slavist uh, and, uh, in some sense, anti-Western or West skeptic uh, tendency in um, Slovak 19th century national building, which is one important legacy. Now, of course, I would like to avoid the impression that um, I'm saying that this defines um, um, Slovak identity completely. No, that's not true. Um, some of my Slovak friends uh, sometimes get annoyed uh, because they say I brand them as Russophiles. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not what I intend to do. Uh, not you know, not to generalize in a, uh, in a kind of sweeping sense. Um, because identities and uh, historical legacies never determine us. They shape us, uh, but uh, they never determine us completely. And uh, I think that's something that you explained very well uh, in the book, in Adam's and Christina's introduction. I liked the way you kind of tackled this in a very balanced way. Uh, you said, uh, yes, these things, these legacies do shape us. I mean, there is no escape from, from them. So I enjoyed the way um, you were honest to yourself. Uh, but of course, um, identities should never be understood uh, as reified. Right? And it is never uh, a determined pattern. Right? Um, having said that, this um, uh, Sturvian legacy is, is an important, uh, an important um, element um, in the Slovak national identity, and we still, still see signs of it uh, today right? uh, in terms of how uh, the debate is framed, uh, especially in certain circles about Russia and, and the West. Um, another important point which is uh, connected, um, directly connected to Pan-Slavism is the um, kind of collective memory of being uh, a part of something bigger, a part of some larger cultural or geopolitical entity. Um, so let's say Stor would imagine uh, the Slovaks as being uh, one of the Slavic tribes. Right? So it's a, a kind of imagined community of Slavdom, which is really imagined. Uh, from a scientific point of view, it doesn't exist. Uh, but but uh, to the Slovak revivalists and pan-Slavists, it, 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 it was very much real, the imagined community of Slavdom, uh, with Slovaks being just one tribe uh, in that larger family. But also there was a, um, you know, a, a rather more kind of realistic and uh, down-to-earth project of uh, Czechoslovakism, which was a doctrine of... Uh, um, the Czechs and the Slovaks being two tribes of the same nation, the same people. And this was the official doctrine on which the first Czechoslovak Republic uh, was built. Right? So again, the idea of being part of something larger. Um, and in contrast to that, um, of course, there is uh, one thing that also makes uh, Slovakia, which makes it stand out uh, as compared to um, 
uh, to, let's say, Poland or Hungary um, in particular. And that is um, the absence of um, what I would call, well, I mean, for lack of a better word, uh, imperialist memory, collective imperialist memory. Um, I said that um, um, Slovak national building uh, was not anchored in, uh, in, a, in a larger territorial entity, you know, a historical Slovak state. Uh, what you're seeing here, uh, well, it's a desperate attempt uh, to find uh, an empire in one's past. This is a monument uh, to, uh, to Svetopluk of uh, Great Moravia, uh, who preceded <laughs> Um, to have preceded the um, Slovak national building, nation building by several hundred years. Uh, but of course the attempt is very desperate uh, because the connection between modern Slovaks and, um, and somebody who was uh, active in the region uh, uh, before the Hungarian tribes arrived and uh, put an end to the Slavic empire, that connection is, is far from obvious. Um, we know that all, all memories are constructed uh, but um, the connection between, let's say, the Hungarian and the Polish, uh, the modern Hungarian and Polish states, and um, and uh, historical kingdoms of Poland and Hungary, are far more obvious uh, than um, the attempts to um, connect uh, modern Slovakia to Great Moravia uh, from a thousand years ago. Um, that's why I'm saying the statue looks very awkward. Um, I mean, also in terms of how it's executed, the, the guy looks like he's about um, to um, fall off his horse. Um, but um, still, uh, the statue was put up in the Bratislava castle uh, somewhat 10 years ago as a kind of a desperate attempt to establish uh, a connection with uh, a great empire. Now, besides that, besides that connection, which many people don't take too seriously, uh, there is no memory of being a great power or an empire, which is what makes Slovakia, of course, different from uh, other uh, countries in the V4. Um, Christina and Adam, you wrote in the introduction that um, there is no imperial legacy or something like that that would um, provoke some kind of nostalgia in, uh, in the region uh, that he said that the only candidate was Austria and Austria had, you know, has uh, long, uh, you know, renounced its, its, uh, its imperial ambition. Uh, well, I'm, I don't think I agree with that because I think that even the contributions in the book, like the Polish contribution, um, illustrate very well that there, there is an <laughs> And nostalgia, uh, nostalgia um, for greatness, uh, which we do see in the Polish case and also in the Hungarian case. Of course, uh, in the Hungarian case, it's uh, you know there is a bit of a dog whistle involved uh, when Orban talks about the Carpathian Basin. He really means something else. Um, it's it's a it's a new name for an old uh, an older geopolitical entity. And the, the Polish case, I mean, the, the Jagiellonian idea, the idea of being a great multicultural state or empire, that is something that, uh, that um, uh, you know, uh, should give you greater self-confidence as a nation. So those imperial legacies, I think, are very much there uh, in, in the Polish and the Hungarian case, but nothing, nothing of that sort uh, uh, is um, to be discovered in in uh, Slovakia. Now, to fast forward to uh, the 21st century, um, I picked uh, these two images because they're highly um, symbolic in, in my opinion. I mean, the one on the right is uh, largely self-explanatory. Um, the one on the left is um, a Slovak um, anniversary Euro coin which is dedicated to none other than Ludovic Stur, um, the father of uh, standard Slovak, the Russophile, the critic of the West, um, who is now portrayed on this anniversary uh, Euro coin, uh, which I find highly ir ironic, um, especially if we compare this to the image on the right. Uh, if, um, if you'd um, fallen asleep in the 19th century, 
where um, Slovaks were the largest, well, I mean, we can debate about this, but they're one of, one of the biggest Russophiles uh, in, in, in the region, at least if you compare it to the three other uh, V4 nations. And um, the elites of the Kingdom of Hungary were highly suspicious of uh, pan-Slavism because they thought it was a, a plot uh, to destroy uh, to destroy the unity of the Kingdom of Hungary. You know, this was the, uh, the, the Russian plot. So if you fall asleep in the 19th century, when you wake up now, you will realize how interesting this looks. You have uh, a very Russia-friendly uh, Hungarian prime minister, um, and you have, as one uh, Hungarian political scientist told me, for the first time in history, you have a pro-Russian electorate in Hungary, which sympathizes with, uh, with Russia, quote unquote. Um, so uh, I think that this is a very amusing and entertaining flip, right? Uh, which again goes back to the idea. This you know speaks back to the point of identities being malleable, uh, of not being reified, of not being deterministic or not being predetermined. Um, these things evolve and change and sometimes shape shift in very entertaining ways, uh, where you have an ironic flip after, um, what, 150 to 100 years. Yeah. So, uh, I promise to frame this as a, a story of uh, the two outliers, Slovakia being the outlier in the kind of negative sense of being, uh, of falling behind, um, of being, um, well, this is a quote from uh, the Western discourse about Slovakia in the 90s, of being the black hole of Europe, and um, suddenly graduating into something that you might call a success story, right? So you do have um, a record of Slovakia overcoming authoritarianism, um, the brief but traumatic period of authoritarianism under Vladimir Mečiar, um, implementing successful economic reforms. Um, so the the you know the kind of amusing nickname of the Tatra Tiger. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, well known outside of Slovakia, but uh, <laughs> at least um, that is a, a kind of a marketing effort on the part of the Slovaks. Uh, you do have a country presently with a strong civil society, um, uh, rather strong independent media. Um, you know, at least if you compare that to the Hungarian situation, um, you know, the, it's a different world. Um, but also, you know, some processes in, uh, say, the Czech Republic, so the, the so called babishization of, of, of uh, major media. Um, Slovakia looks quite, quite, um, quite good in that aspect, right? Um, you have a country that elected its first female president, who is also, if I'm not mistaken, the first female president in the V4. Um, so, Zuzana Chaputova. Um, and also before her, um, um, Slovakia had a president who was um, regarded as the symbol of pro-democratic, liberal, um, pro-liberal, pro-democratic, pro-Western figure. Um, and you do have a generally your optimistic outlook in the foreign policy in Slovakia. So coalitions tend to be uh, pro, much more pro-EU than uh, anywhere else in the V4. Um, not to mention the euro, right? So Slovakia is the... Um, it's the only V4 uh, state to have introduced the euro. Now, of course, um, with the euro and with everything else, you can debate to what extent uh, it is useful. I mean, and uh, freedom of debate is very important. Um, you can even debate, you know, you can debate about anything. You can debate about foreign policy orientations. You can debate about euro skepticism or euro realism. And whether an ever closer union um, is something which is desirable, um, fine. Um, Let's not be dogmatic about that, uh, but at least from the perspective of the 90s, from the perspective of the so-called return to the West, 
uh, from the point of view of the goals that the region um, set for itself after the end of the Cold War, uh, I think you can, uh, you can argue safely that Slovakia is an outlier in the positive sense. So it's a success story if you compare it to, well, we've experienced um, several uh, very interesting years following the 2015 uh, migration crisis, which was the critical point when the V4 came back. It was a very different grouping. It was a grouping that defined itself in juxtaposition to the West for the first time in history, because the point of the V4 was, you know, to make it simple, uh, to return to the West collectively. That was the idea of, of a central Europe that was kidnapped and now comes back to the European family. In 2015, uh, we had a very interesting moment when the V4 defined itself in opposition uh, to the West, or at least to certain uh, Western norms and policies. Now, that was a point where Slovakia also uh, joined, uh, joined in uh, into that collective voice. But um, soon enough, um, it preferred to distance itself from um, V4 states like Poland and Hungary. I mean, one of the most radical proposals um, not so long ago was, was by a Slovak uh, uh, MEP, member of the European Parliament, who said we should leave the V4 because it has a very bad name. We don't want to be put in the same basket uh, with, uh, with, with Hungary and Poland. Um, Robert Fico, the former prime minister, who is not known for his, uh, you know, is not known for um, for extremely liberal views, uh, and who was one uh, one of the um, uh, one of the politicians who tried to exploit the uh, migration crisis 2015. Um, he said very quickly that, uh, you know what, we are a pro-European island in the V4, uh, and our living space is not the V4, it is the EU. He actually used the term living space. I'm not sure if he realized what kind of tropes that invoked, uh, but that's what he said. Our living space is in the, uh, in the EU, not in the V4. So um, as far as uh, um, exploiting the kind of um, anti-Western or uh, Eurosceptic face of the V4 uh, goes. Uh, Slovakia's uh, participation was rather ad hoc or opportunistic, I would say. Um, and uh, subsequently, uh, the Slovak elites tried to distance themselves from this uh, uh, Polish-Hungarian kind of um, enterprise. Um, and part of it might have to do with the things that I uh, described in brief, uh, the having a great empire in the past, because that's simply uh, not what Slovak history looked like. It is rather um, a collective memory of being a part of something larger, right? of looking up to some larger partner. Uh, might have been Russia, in the 19th century. Today, it could be someone else, let's say Germany. And these two uh, collective memories, being a part of something larger um, and uh, looking for uh, bigger, stronger partners is apparently what influences uh, the Slovak foreign policy outlook and um, also uh, how Slovakia treats its cooperation with uh, the V4 on um, certain uh, sensitive issues. Uh, not to say that um, everything can be determined uh, by the past. Obviously it isn't. Again, coming back to the point of identities not being reified um, and sometimes even being strategically used and redefined by the actors. However, I would still argue that um, certain things in the past, there are ways in which certain things in the past shape our present outlooks. And uh, in that sense, uh, I think the Slovak story is also um, 
rather informative and interesting. Um, yeah, that's where I'll stop. Is it working? Oh, no, 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 okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks for your presentation and uh, for giving us an overview about what Slovak identity can mean and uh, um, how it has developed. And this, I think this concept of um, the laggard of the 90s is very interesting because as I made a, a reference, uh, the issues within the Visegrad 4 um, grouping that there was kind of um, the Mejia government in the 1990s who was kind of problematic and f leading to a falling behind in the European uh, uh, Union uh, integration process in the 1990s. And then um, the other three joined NATO 1999 and uh, Slovakia was a yeah, bit exactly. behind. Exactly, had to wait. Yeah, exactly. So, but then they managed together to join the European Union. So I thought this was um, interesting. But then what happened that it quickly turned the other direction in the 1990s. And now we have this pro-European approach, this, the first uh, country of the Visegrad 4 being a, a member of the Eurozone. Uh, and as well, even having this kind of idea, you know, we are actually, it's not, we're not confined to this, the Visegrad 4 countries, but we have a broader outlook, actually, into Europe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Should we collect uh, questions? I thank you, Alex, for this great presentation. Um, and for your critical comments on the book. So just a precision concerning uh, imperial nostalgia. So the point in the introduction about that is that we should be careful with Central European nostalgia because it might dissimulate nostalgia for empire. So for nostalgia for a situation where, among others, Hungarians used to oppress others. So it's not only cultural, there, there is this imperial part of it. And indeed, you're perfectly right, there is another story in the region, and that's the Polish Empire, but I'm afraid that's not fully Central European, or it's not the territory of the V4. It's Poland looking eastward. But you are right to, uh, to, to underline that this is also there in the V4 as another uh, form of nostalgia. What I said was basically about this middle European uh, nostalgia for, for before 1920. Uh, a couple of questions uh, on what you said. You started with folklore and in a rather um, refreshing way. Um, how is it right now in Slovakia in the sense of, is it possible to laugh about these things and to consider or nationality, a bit like folklore, and uh, you know, to laugh about it. I tell you why, because the, one of the, the received ideas we have in Hungary about Slovaks is that they are full with resent, and it's impossible to laugh with them about, about uh, nationalities. An additional question is, are there any territorial claims in Slovakia, knowing, the, so is, there, is there something called Greater Slovakia? And another comment is that it appears that we are always talking about the V4, but when, we, when it's about the V4 being a region against Europe, it seems to me, and you seem to confirm that, it's basically Poland and Hungary all the time. So half of it. So are we still talking about the region at all, or is it the bigger half? Two? Yes, but two out of four still, so this would be fine. Okay, thank you. Should I answer or do we? Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, 
I mean, uh, starting from the last question, which is the, the, the easiest one, um, uh, yes, I mean, but th that was sort of part of my point, that this participation in, uh, well, let's call it illiberal, uh, for lack of a better word, um, illiberal discourse, you know, anti-migration and anti-Brussels sovereignist. That's something which, um, you know, for let's say the Polish government or the Hungarian government might be part of their ideological program, uh, but for uh, people in Slovakia, that was something that was rather situational and opportunistic because elections were coming up. And as soon as uh, they were done with the elections, uh, they felt like they wanted to distance themselves from, uh, from um, this liberalism uh, because it was doing more damage uh, than good also to their personal agendas you know they didn't want to be put in the same basket uh, with uh, with Orban or or Kaczynski um, I think that uh, you're right um, and also it's an interesting question to to which extent we should speak of the V4 as a region but I think that it is a form of regionalism a region building project uh, and to be fair, yes, there are four countries, um, but um, look at the relative size of, of Poland, <laughs> together with Hungary, um, I think. If we speak about the V4, it uh, represents more than a half of that region, but if you, if you count it by, by states, then um, obviously uh, you're perfectly, perfectly right. And uh, this doesn't, um, this doesn't um, um, add up to um, to a region, um, to a V4 region. Mm. You know, what else, what else to say on this? Uh, on the question of whether it is possible to laugh about, about Slovakia and the national identity, well, it's always trickier when you are not Slovak. <laughs> so I, I have to be careful, even, even though, you know, I'm a researcher and I, I do critical analysis, but it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not so easy because this isn't this is irony, but it's not self-irony. I can be ironic about Belarus. I mean, no, no one can stop me there. Um, but in 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 principle, I did not uh, notice, you know, any serious obstacle to uh, to making jokes about uh, about Slovakia because um, I don't think there are any sore issues. Uh, to the extent to which they are in, in, uh, in some other places, like, like this one. Um, Greater Slovakia, uh, well, see, this is the thing. Um, there is no collective memory of a territory. I mean, there's a great Moravia, but we have very vague ideas about what it was and, and you know, where the borders ran, and, and it's, it's, it's a complete, you know, kind of uh, com com completely virtual um, imaginary construct. And uh, as you very well know, um, the post-World War, uh, the, 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 the post-World War um, arrangement uh, of the borders was rather in favor. It used to be part of the Slovak elections. Uh, I remember that when I came to uh, to Slovakia, you could see these um, uh, these posters uh, trying to scare people with the Hungarian irredentism. So it would say "Pozhan no Bratislava," you know, to, um, to watch out because they're, they're coming. But um, interestingly enough, that completely or almost completely disappeared from the agenda. Um, so the Hungarian issue is a non-issue at the moment, Slovak politics, which to some extent shows you how, you know, artificial and constructed those things can be. They can just disappear, you know, you switch the discourse off and on. Um, part of that might have had to do with the um, migration crisis because uh, the migrants, the so-called imaginary migrant, to, to quote one of my colleagues, is a much more convenient enemy. Okay, we can take a quick question because we have to move on then to the next agenda, but I think take one question. Mm. 
My name is Dr. Stadl Sabine from Vienna, Austria. I'm a colleague. I speak rather well Slovak, and I remember Slovak history during 1960s and 1980s as Czechoslovak history. So my question to you is, in how far are you still Czech, and in how far do you rely on your national mans like Al 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 Alexander Dubček? He was the leader of Czechoslovakia and was Slovak. So in how far do you make a continuity in your history to the Czech Republic, first of all? Second, a short question. You were a, a very vivid com, com, communist government. Did you leave this completely? I'm sorry, say again, this is the second question. You were a very vivid com, communist government, Slovak, Czech, Czechoslovakia. And therefore I ask you, is there any kind of continuity now in your thinking? Is there a thinking for a better Slovak uh, um, thinking, a better Slovak knowledge, a better Slovak pop, pop, uh, population like this? Thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I'm afraid I didn't catch the second question, but maybe somebody could uh, rephrase it for me. It was me. about communist uh, legacies in Slovak, Slovakia and Czech. Uh, hmm. Well, I mean, uh, the Czechoslovak uh, period of history um, is, is uh, obviously very important because it is regarded, and, and you know, and justly so, as uh, a stage, a period in, uh, in the development of uh, Slovak nation and statehood. Because Czechoslovakia was an arrangement that allowed uh, Slovaks to develop uh, their national culture, education, and yes, I mean the uh, the, the idea of Czechoslovakism was that uh, you could have a Slovak in, in Prague <laughs> um, running running the country. Um, so yes, I mean it is uh, acknowledged and, and and recognized as an you know as a crucial part of, of Slovak history. Um, it's not celebrated in the same way as it is in, in, in the Czech Republic, but um, you know, with the public holidays and days off, uh, but it's certainly uh, written to the textbooks. And the communist legacy, I'm not not so sure about. Uh, maybe we can discuss this over the coffee break because I didn't really catch the the idea. Yeah, so that's probably where we stop, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again for the presentation. Okay, thanks again for the presentation. Thanks for all the questions. Sorry, I just rather prefer to move on. I just want to say that we have followers from abroad. So our colleagues from uh, the University of Sarajevo are actually watching us. Um, and uh, colleagues as well from uh, Macedonia, uh, North Macedonia, excuse myself. Um, and we have received questions as well on the YouTube channel, which we will see if we can uh, um, answer them now or later in the afternoon, because we have the afternoon session, which is a, going to be an online discussion uh, with the colleagues as well who were involved in the book. But now, but not least, uh, we are very delighted uh, that um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sultan Bogac is with us today. He um, is going to discuss uh, the issues discussed now and the issues uh, raised in the book. And uh, uh, Dr. Bogadze is um, works at the University of Western West Hungary, Chopron, um, and is conducting, you know, an economist, political scientist, and I found out even uh, you have uh, done a master's in Southeast European studies. So an expert on a lot of fields. So we're delighted to get his back. Thanks very much. Thank you very much um, for the word. I would like to start by congratulating those people who have contributed to this book, especially the two editors, Christina and Adam Benza. It's a, a wonderful book. Thank you very much for the opportunity of having read it. And all of those people who have written chapters in the book, I'd like to congratulate them and thank you uh, for your work. And also, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak about this book uh, today. Um, as you have introduced me, I have a background in very different fields. Actually, I even studied sociology right here in this room uh, a long time ago. I spent five years studying this, this very room uh, when I was studying sociology. Uh, then I have 
Uh, yes, a background in Southeastern European studies, which I studied at the CEU. Uh, I became very interested in that region after the Yugoslav Wars. Uh, and when I was a sociology student, I was working with um, Elamir, the late Elamir Honkish, who was one of the leading figures in uh, the sociology of values in Hungary. Uh, and so at that point in time, I was very interested in issues of identity and values and stuff like that. But I, I kind of drifted away from that, uh, having studied economics as well. And so I ended up doing more economics than, uh, than sociology or political science. Uh, now, the reason why it was a great pleasure for me to read this book is that it kind of brought me back uh, to the period around transition and after transition uh, when this region had to find its identity. So as it is often mentioned in the book itself, the uh, Soviet period was a kind of Yugoslav period in the case of the Western Balkans, was a kind of a suppression of identities. Uh, all kinds of issues were gathering up, not only issues related to the communist period itself, but issues related to the Holocaust, issues related to the 1930s, issues related to the time of the Austro-Hungarian Ottoman empires, and going back very, very far, actually, probably even to Svatopluk. Um, so all these issues were never really discussed in a democratic manner. Most of these countries never really had a uh, a democratic history. I would say that the only exception was probably Czechoslovakia, which, in, to, in my opinion, was uh, a democracy in any meaningful way in the interwar period. Uh, even that country had its problems, obviously, but that came closer, closest to being a, a, a democracy in the Western sense. But it, almost every other country was very, very limited in terms of its democracy, so it never had a chance to discuss issues of identity in a democratic form. And when uh, transition happened in 1989, we suddenly had a chance to discuss not only the communist past, but also all kinds of issues from uh, a, a very long period of time stretching back uh, centuries, effectively. And all these ideas suddenly emerged. There was an overflow, in a sense, of uh, all kinds of ideas, some of them better, some of them terrible. Um, but it was very difficult to differentiate between the good ideas and the bad ideas because there was such an oversupply of people with their ideas trying to uh, somehow narrate the world around them and, and find an identity in a free society. Uh, and I remember, obviously, nationalism was one of those issues that came back. So national entities, some of these states were establishing themselves as new entities. Slovakia at the time was known for its mechiarist nationalist uh, stance, as you have just pointed out. Huge change, as you have also pointed out. Uh, Serbia with Milosevic. Uh, so some, in some countries, obviously, especially the ones which were finding their uh, Tudjman, Croatia, which were finding their uh, national identities and separating from larger entities, this was stronger. Ironically, Hungary was probably at the time one of the least nationalist countries, uh, not having to establish a, a, a separate an entity uh, at all. So nationalism was obviously one of those. And then the idea of Central Europe was another one. It was very much in the air. All this talk about Visegrad and the uh, semi-periphery of Europe and uh, all these ideas. And the third one was Europe. Obviously, immediately, there was this idea of the integration of to Europe. And all these three are very much dealt with in the book. So I really like the, the fact that you operate on these three levels, national, Central European, and and European. And I also really like about the book that you are very critical of all three. So you don't accept at face value any of those three levels. You actually de try to deconstruct uh, a lot of that. And now, um, 
Theoretically, there should not be necessarily a contradiction between the three. One can be Slovak and Central European and European at the time, uh, at the same time. Uh, looking at it from the perspective of uh, a Chinese or an American, why would there be a contradiction between being all three at the same time? Yet, uh, we all know that in the 1990s, these were posed as contradictions. And this appears very well in the book, that these are contradictions because they became narratives, because they became con they are constructs. And I very much like the fact that you all treat them as constructs. Now, them being constructs is obvious in some cases, but not in other cases. So if you're a nationalist, uh, for you it's obvious that there is such a thing as a nation and the whole idea of nationalism. It's not obvious why you should deconstruct it. If you are a liberal, in, 19, in the 1990s, the concept of Central Europe was very much a liberal concept. I remember, and it's written, it's actually mentioned it in the book, it was promoted by people like Kundera or Konrad or Czeslav Milos or people like that, Havel. Uh, it was definitely a liberal concept, juxtaposed to nationalism. Let's surpass our nationalisms and let's have a larger entity. Uh, the idea of Europe was kind of a compromise. It wasn't really tied to either the nationalist or the liberal side. Um, but after a while, I think it became more of a liberal idea. So nationalists often juxtaposed themselves to Europe. Milosevic did that, uh, 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 definitely Mechiar did that, Orban does it today. Um, it's always vis-a-vis -vis Europe that you define your nationalism. So it, in that sense, it by default shifted into the kind of liberal corner. And we tend to use this, for a long time we've used this, these expressions like Europeanization or European values, um, which if you're a liberal, you don't see why that should be deconstructed. So if you're a nationalist, you don't see why you should deconstruct the nation. If you're a liberal, you don't see why you should deconstruct the idea of European values. And yet, in this book, I find the deconstruction of both, which I really like, because I find it very balanced that you do this. For, for, for nationalists to see why you're actually creating a construct and how you're creating a construct, and this is what I enjoyed very much reading, country by country, how this construct of nationalism is created. And if you're, we tend to be stuck in our national discourses. Being a Hungarian, I'm more familiar with the Hungarian construction of nationalism. Obviously, I try to follow a little bit the other countries, but this kind of expert level discussion is extremely informative. Um, I mean, I do spend a lot of time in Croatia, but to have read uh, and not, not really like the Slovaks or the Poles or the Hungarians. But then you, with the migration crisis, and then the very term migration crisis is deconstructed. So is it a migration crisis or a refugee issue? Is it a crisis at all? Even there is this deconstruction, which I really like. Um, then Czech identity suddenly sort of merges into the Visegrad one. I and mean, there's no difference anymore. Nobody really seriously believes that the Czechs are superior in any way to, uh, to the region. So, you know, if there was once a Slovak ruling in Prague, there is once again a Slovak ruling in Prague. Um, and their nationalism is just, it fits very well into uh, the, the nationalism of the region. It doesn't really matter a lot of the time what sort of a political force provides a government in your Visegrad countries, they all tend to fit in very well into uh, to this kind of uh, Visegrad response to, for instance, the migration crisis. I'm going to leave it there. Um, the, um, so the deconstruction of nationalism is very interesting. Uh, and you learn a lot about other countries if you read this. And I think every, everybody should be reading up sometimes. Every now and then you should refresh your knowledge of how other countries in the region construct their nationalism. You see a lot of similarities. You see a lot of specialties. But it's very informative to do that. 
Um, but then you also deconstruct the idea of Central Europe, and you also deconstruct the idea of Europe. And I was listening very keenly when Adam was speaking at the beginning, and you used the term, at the beginning of your talk, you used the term Europeanization and European values. And I was going to, my, I was going to myself, oh my God, oh my God, uh, unreconstructed, uh, unreflexive uh, Europeanization. But then you deconstructed it. Then towards the second half of your talk, you actually de deconstructed the idea of European values when you mentioned um, the way we were talking about the Yugoslav war in the 90s. When you mentioned the fact that there was similar, uh, that, that the deconstructed as well. Europe does not equal democracy and Europe does not equal liberty. Europe has a past of imperialism. Europe has a past of genocide. And it, the Yugoslav wars are just as much a part of Europe as anything else. Um, so you can't just pick and choose and cherry pick the positive sides and say European values are all about coexistence and tolerance and liberty and all of that. And you forget everything else and you suddenly elevate these European values. Any other continent could do that. Why wouldn't? The United States does it all, all, all the time as well. I mean, they tend to only speak about the positive side of their democracy, but never about, you know, uh, racism, uh, imperialism, stealing the land from the Indians, regime change in the third world countries. That's always forgotten. It's all, only the positive side of being the greatest democracy on the face of this earth. This earth. And we do that in Europe too. So I really like the fact that in this book you deconstruct that too. It's very balanced. You deconstruct nationalism, you deconstruct uh, Europeanism, Europeanization as well. Now, um, and that's also interesting because it kind of raises, as I'm reading the book, it raises the question in my head so what is it that defines this region? What is my conclusion from having read all of this? What is the um, characteristic, the uniqueness, the differentia specific of this region? And I suddenly get the impression that most of these chapters deal with nationalism. So you seem to imply latently, probably not explicitly, but you seem to imply latently that probably fervent nationalism is somehow a unique characteristic of this region. Why else would you all be looking at nationalism and deconstructing nationalism if it wasn't uh, the characteristic? And I also like the fact that you differentiate between positive attachment to a place and nationalism which is against someone else. So not not necessarily is an attachment to a place negative or harmful. You can, you can like stuff positively. I mean, if we talk about Central Europe, for instance, we could be writing books, and I'd love to write a book about the common cultural heritage of Central Europe, how we all eat Apfelstrudel, um, Wiener Schnitzel, uh, Goulash, uh, even Halushki, uh, we all drink beer and we have all the same words and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And could, we know about this. We have this common Central European heritage. So why not write a book about this positive attachment, which doesn't hurt anybody? People from outside love it. If somebody comes here from New York, they love this. Um, the, uh, the pro Viktor Orban came to power for the second time in 2010. Uh, he was one of the first of this wave of uh, right-wing leaders to come to power. Probably the first, but one of the first, definitely. And many liberals were actually making the claim that Hungary is a unique country uh, in that it has this fervent nationalism. I definitely remember Agnes Heller, the late Agnes Heller, making that claim all of the time, that somehow Hungary is this Galapagos island where the right remained nationalistic. 
And everywhere else in Europe, the political right is civilized, uh, centrist, moderate, like Angela Merkel, the icon. Uh, everywhere else, they have reflected upon their past and they have become very centrist and nice and moderate. Only in Hungary is the political right nationalistic and demagogic and xenophobic, etc. Heller made that claim all of the time. Now, I think with the benefit of hindsight, having experienced a wave of people, not only in Europe, but across the world, that claim is definitely wrong. I, th I don't think anybody questions that anymore, that Hungary is not a Galapagos island, and the right is not Angela Merkel. Actually, I would even forecast that if Angela Merkel retires, Germany is going to go the same way. There are very powerful forces in Germany pushing that country towards that. Probably not as fervently as in the rest of the region, but definitely there's a shift. There's a gradual shift to the right even in Germany. But if you look at the likes of Kaczynski, Salvini, Vucic, uh, Gruevski, uh, Erdogan, Le Pen, Red Wilders, Farage, uh, the Swedish Democrats, the true Finns, Donald Trump, Benjamin Netanyahu, Modi, Shinzo Abe, shall I go on? I mean, do we still seriously believe that somehow Viktor Orban is an island to himself and he's the Galapagos of the right? I don't think so. There is definitely a wave. This is far beyond Central Europe. This is far beyond Central and Eastern Europe. It doesn't, nationalism doesn't characterize the Visegrad countries, and it doesn't characterize the West Balkans as a kind of differentia specific, specifica. Obviously, it's there. Obviously, it's strongly there. But it's not, it doesn't differentiate this region from other parts of the world. Um, so it helps sometimes, I think, to move a little bit above the region to be looking at the region. I, the, the time when I felt most European was when I was in Shanghai or in New York. The, those places I feel really European. In Europe, we see the differences. You go further away, you realize how, you know, how Europe is different and how it is not different. That sort of perspective, I think, helps. Now, I read these chapters, and I really like the treatment at the national level. I'm getting a lot of information about how nationalism is constructed at the national level. But I'm also thinking, um, do these constructions of nationalism really characterize an entire society? And my problem with a lot of the chapters was that they treated societies and cultures as if they were homogenous. Um, and I don't think that's where the research of values is today. I mean, in the 1990s, we were all showing each other these wonderful maps of Ingerhardt and Weltzell, the World Values Survey. Uh, and we're looking at you know, where countries are on this map. But value sociology stepped beyond that. We don't presuppose national cultures anymore. Because if we did presuppose national cultures, all we would be doing is we would be strengthening the nationalist idea of a, a, a homogenous national culture with the best intentions, if you're a liberal, and you start showing on the map where Hungary is as a point, a dot, all you're doing is you're reinforcing the nationalist conception that there is a homogenous Hungarian culture. But there isn't. What value sociology does today is it looks at clusters of values, subnational clusters of values. And in Hungary today, we have many subnational clusters of values. 
somebody who is a voter of the formerly far-right Jobbik has this kind of 19th century value cluster of, of fervent nationalism. Somebody who is a voter of the Socialist Party today has a 20th, 20th century value cluster of modernity and modernization and speaks the discourse of modernization. Somebody who is a voter of the Green Parties in Hungary, and we have two Green Parties, has a postmodern value cluster, is part of the postmodern value cluster, which is postmodernizationist, doesn't want to modernize anymore, actually wants more bicycles than cars in the street. Now, these, and there are many other clusters as well, but these three groups of people are not part of a homogenous culture. You cannot presuppose that Hungary has, so therefore to speak of Hungary as being nationalistic or uh, paternalistic or um, family-oriented, et cetera, et cetera, I think is a treatment which would deserve more in the sense of break, going below the level of the national. And there's a conflict there. It's a conflict of different cultures. Now, if you treat Hungary as a unit, you get the impression that Viktor Orban is popular. But we have 8 million voters in this country, and 2.3, 2.5, vote for Viktor Orban and his cluster, his cultural cluster. Now, I don't think that's outstanding. I think it's a good result. He's a very charismatic politician. He's a very hardworking politician. He has brought together a, a huge camp, which he keeps together. But it's not an outstanding result. A lot of right-wing political parties receive that sort of an uh, a result. Uh, the problem is that the opposition has completely fallen apart. They have lost their supporters. But two and a half million out of eight isn't, you can't say it's a homogenous culture. And I'm sure it's the same in other countries as well. Because it has to be. It's a contestation between different cultures. Um, you can't say Slovakia was all Machiarist in the 1990s, and then suddenly now it's all Chaputova. These are value clusters which struggle with each other within the nation state, below the level of the nation state. And I think that's one way, at least in my opinion, that's one way to take forward this research look at this contestation below the national level and not treat countries. Because if you do treat countries as homogenous, in my, in my view, all you're doing is you're reinforcing the claim by nationalist leaders that there is such a thing as a homogenous culture, which, which doesn't help in the deconstruction of nationalism. So showing these maps of Ingehat and Belza from 30 years ago will not help. And then, the next question which comes to my mind as I'm reading these chapters is, these are very, very good descriptions of how identity is constructed, both nationalist and Central European and European, how it is constructed, but not why it is constructed. I keep asking myself, why is it constructed? Uh, it's one thing to describe, and you do this very, very well. It's very convincing how you describe the construction of these identities. But why are these identities constructed? And why is one of them more successful than the other one? Uh, and there's a small hint in the chapter on Croatia and Serbia, where the author quotes uh, the ordinary person in the street who says, well, actually, these constructions up there in the elite are really to convince us that these things matter and to distract our attention away from everyday realities, the fact that we are poor. So these politicians, they have to somehow 
gather votes, they have to keep communities together. I mean, everybody knows that corruption is rampant in the region. Uh, one identity could be rampant corruption. Uh, everybody knows that elites have benefited greatly from transition, and ordinary people have not. And the poorest have had a miserable couple of decades. What is the um, purpose of, construct of constructing these identities? And I'm not only speaking of nationalism, I'm also speaking of Europeanization here. What, what are the purposes? What are the, why do politicians do this? As the man on the street knows, I think, very well that the reason why they do this is because they want to distract our attention away from the fact that this region is not very successful economically. Um, if you compare it to other regions, I like to compare it to China. China, 1990, we thought of China as a very backward, third world, underdeveloped country. We thought of China that way 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Probably a lot of people thought of China five years ago that way. And I still meet people who think of China today as being a very backward country. You think this until you actually go to China, and you actually realize that in these 30 years, they have developed 90 years. Within these 30 years, they have come from 30 years behind us to 30 years before us. They are technological leaders in a lot of stuff, uh, 5G being the most important example, but there are many other technologies as well, high-speed trains, solar energy, et cetera. Their infrastructure, their cities, they have moved 800 million people from poverty to, middle to the middle class. I think that especially the, at least the border, the, the coastal regions of China are now ahead of Central and Eastern Europe in terms of development. What did we achieve in these 30 years? We've got pretty much stagnation, I would say. Our relative position to the European, the West of Europe, Pretty much Austria, which is the eternal example for everybody here, it's pretty much the same. And there's no huge exception here. I mean, liberals like to point at Estonia or sometimes Slovakia. There's always a kind of employee of the month, uh, you know. But these are not convincing. The figures are not convincing. Nobody really left this region and became Western Europe. Nobody, Western European, nobody really believes that any of these countries have made that jump across the Iron Curtain. Uh, that Iron Curtain is still there in terms of poverty. The majority of people don't have a chance to be European because to be European, you need to travel, you need to go to these places, and you need to experience them. We can be European because as middle-class people, we have been to these places, we have stayed in those hotels, we've been to those conferences, those museums, we have acquaintances from those places. You have Facebook friends from Belgium or Greece. The average person in this region does not. They don't, they don't even have a friend from the neighboring country. The average Hungarian doesn't even have a friend from Slovakia. There's no way you will be Central European. There's no way you will be European. These identities will not be your identities. You're too poor for that. So the liberal story of Europe doesn't sell. Uh, because you, you, you don't experience it. The majority of people don't experience it. What does sell is the nationalist story. Because if you're poor, you cannot construct a story of economic success. That would be an alternative. I have become middle class. The Chinese have that. 800 million Chinese people have. China has its own problems. I'm not trying to paint China as a miracle. Obviously, it has its political problems. It has its environmental problems, etc. But 800 million people in China have that story of my family became middle class. This is who we are. We've become rich. Very, very few people in this region have that. This is reflected in births. People are not giving birth. This is reflected in outward migration. 
A lot of people have moved to the west of Europe because they don't believe that they have a future in this region. Depopulation. If you look at the, globally, if you look at uh, this region, it's the fastest depopulating region of the world. It's not an accident. Bulgaria is the number one country, but almost all of these countries in the region, the Baltic states have, one third of the Baltic states have emptied out. Uh, it's not an accident. People don't believe in the future, in their future here. And when you have Polish women going to the UK, and suddenly the number of children uh, born to Polish women in the UK is higher than to Muslim women in the UK, whereas it's very, very low in Poland, then you know that there is not a belief in this region locally you only believe in your future if you go to the west of Europe. So this is not, a, not, a, not an economically successful region. If you're not successful economically, there are huge disparities. Obviously, nationalism sells. Because you have to have some sense of identity. You have to justify to yourself and to others what, who you are in this world. And if you cannot claim to be successful economically, you will regress to an, um, identities that are very simple to achieve. It doesn't take much to be a Turk if you're born a Turk. It doesn't take much to be a man if you're born a man. Yeah? It doesn't take much to be non-gypsy if you're not a gypsy. So these identities are very easy to achieve, much easier than economic success, so they sell easily. There's actually no competitor. There's almost no competitor. Being European is not a competitor. Being Central European is not really a competitor. It's a competitor for us. It is for me, because I can go to Vienna and have a Wiener Schnitzel. But the cost of a Wiener Schnitzel in the most expensive restaurants in Vienna is roughly the same as the monthly salary of a public worker in Hungary. They will never go to have a Wiener Schnitzel in, and ride a Fiaca or something like that. They'll never have that. They'll never go to a pub in Prague or visit the Jewish quarter of uh, Krakow or something like that. They'll never have that experience. Um, so I think that's another way to take this forward, to ask the question. You've, I think you have dealt very well with the question of how identities constructed. I think one way to take this forward is to ask the question, why identities constructed? Um, and why is it so successful in the case of nationalism? Why is it not successful in the case of Central Europeanism or West Balkanism um, or European, Europeanization? Um, what could be an alternative identity? I mean, I'm reminded, uh, there was a time when I was very interested in the Scandinavian model. Um, and I always wanted to understand why the social democratic welfare state in Scandinavia was so successful. Um, and then I came across this concept of the Volkhemmet, which is pretty much like the German Volkheimat, uh, Volkhemmet in Swedish, meaning the home of the people. And that was the left wing alternative to nationalism. So in the 1930s, what was happening was that Germany was falling apart. The, the social democrats in Germany completely mishandled the situation. Poor old Rudolf Hirfeding, uh, so probably a wonderful Marxist scholar, but terrible finance minister. He mishandled the situation. Hitler came to power. And in many other countries in Europe, the far right came to power not in Scandinavia. Uh, they managed to have an alternative to the, the far-right discourse, and their alternative was the Falkhamet, the idea of the people's homes, the people's home. The idea that everybody in Sweden will be helped. There is solidarity. We'll build you housing, we'll give you a good school, we'll give you a health service, so your identity can be a social identity, a social economic identity, uh, not a cultural identity, 
not a linguistic identity, not a genetic identity, but a socio-economic identity. Now that, I think, is completely gone from the discourse today. If you look around 2020, who's selling socio-economic identity? With the neoliberalization of the left, no one is selling that anymore as an alternative. There's only one competitor, and that's the cultural identity. And in some sense, even the left is strengthening that. I mean, when, the, when, the, when liberals say things like, I'm not saying every liberal says that, but many liberals say, oh, these nations are incapable of democracy. They have this feudal heritage which they have carried on. I mean, there's all kinds of variants of this, you know. In Hungary, you talk about the Kadarist heritage or the, uh, uh, from the times of Janos Kadar or the post-Soviet mentality or post post-Yugoslav mentality. I mean, you have the variants of this everywhere. I used, there was a time when I lived in Greece, and once the elevator was broken in a university in Greece, and instead of fixing the elevator, they pointed at the elevator and says, ah, Ottoman heritage. And that was their explanation for the elevator not working, Ottoman heritage, right? So, uh, and these were not nationalist right-wing Greeks. This, these were liberal or even left-wing Greeks. This sort of culturalist homogenization that you try to explain stuff through culturalism, I, in my view, reinforces the ethnicist narrative on the right. Because you're, you're reinforcing the idea that culture is the primary explanation rather than Social, the socio-economic underpinnings, which to me gives, um, which to me legitimizes to a large degree the more competitive discourse on the right. And I'm not saying culture isn't important. Obviously, culture is very important. And it's obviously very, very important to deconstruct cultural identities. And you do this very, very well. Um, but I'm asking as I'm reading this book, is this going to change? Is this going to affect change? Because some people will not even listen to it. Other people will say, well, yes, this is interesting. This is really well done. This is how it is. You have this feeling of, you have deconstructed it for me, and you have, tell, you, you have told me how it is constructed. And you have this feeling of excitement that you see this construction in motion and how it's being done. Uh, but then we go back to the same thing. Why do we go back to the same thing? Because there is no alternative. So the man in the street that is referred to, the Yugoslav, the ex-Yugoslav man in the street who knows that this, these identities are being sold to cover up the lack of economic success are probably not different from the people who were tomorrow go to a nationalist rally. They might know. I have spoken to many, many nationalists or supporters of nationalists who know very well that this is a construction being sold from above. And also liberals who realize very well that the idea of Europeanization can be deconstructed. But with a lack of alternatives, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the same groups tomorrow, because these are the groups that exist. If you don't want to feel isolated, if you don't want to be a, an island in yourself, you want to belong somewhere, these are the only opportunities on offer. You don't have this fork-hammered social economic construction anymore. So you have to join one or the other uh, community of culture, which is basically a game in the elite. It's not played in ordinary society and definitely no, not amongst the poorest. It's a game for the elite. And this only needs the Kulturkampf. If, we, if we're unhappy about Kulturkampf, this is where Kulturkampf comes, comes from. It's, in my view, it's an attempt by the elite to cover up socioeconomic processes. Um, so, I might have sounded a little bit critical, 
But believe me, I'm not. It's what the it's the book that got me started thinking about this. That you're so good at describing how these are constructed, and I have so enjoyed reading how these constructions happen, that it got me started thinking why it happens. So as a kind of modest recommendation, why not write the next book asking this question? Why does this happen? Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks very much for your um, comments and, uh, you know, you started very well with uh, the positives and of course, you know, we are very happy to get criticism as well and to get, you know, new ideas about what to improve. We ended up at the national level by, because the authors actually decided to stay there mm -hmm. and it would be actually interesting as well to look at regions, the sub-region level or, you know, what's really going on on a lower level. But I think this is kind of, kind of a lot of questions coming out of this, um, from this aspect and maybe different ones we have to think about and, you know, maybe who knows what's mm. coming uh, <laughs> in this next part. I just hand the microphone to Adam. Let me take a step back. I don't want to kill you either. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your constructive criticism. Um, and let me reply in a, in a couple of short points. First, thank you very much for underlining the importance of mobility. So I think it completes the answer to a question asked previously. Uh, is there an opposition between national, regional, and continental uh, sense of belonging? Uh, mobility, European mobility, is not only about moving within the European space, it's also about going outside of Europe. And indeed, if you go somewhere else, you realize that all these things are microscopic, seen from Shanghai or New York. The other important thing to, um, to say about mobility is that it remains a privilege. So it's the main, one of the main questions about European identity is that most Europeans are not Europeans actually in the normative sense that we like to praise this um, continental identity. And at the same time, it's a key issue to improve mobility, even for local issues. So even on the local level, mobility does improve democracy. Because if you go abroad, you cannot be told anything, any rubbish about who, what kind of people live in the neighboring countries or elsewhere. So mobility is really key nowadays in Europe, knowing what Europe is nowadays in the world, so mobility. Second point on Hungary being more nationalistic than other countries. Here, I think that indeed this is something quite provincial to say that we, even in our, uh, in an, in our negative characters, we are special. There is something vicious in that, but I think that we can agree that Hungarians are not exactly the most humble tribe on earth. So the most humble, humble tribe nation on earth. So even when it's about bad news about Hungary in the international press, there is some vicious way of still liking it. It's still about us. It makes us special, even if it's horrific what's written about us. So there is something. But you are right, uh, there is something provincial to this, and the region level shouldn't be a provincial one. Um, it's about enlarging these things, and to think that we are really special without knowing anything about the outside world, that's basically, once again, due to a lack of perspective, not only on the region, but on the so-called rest of the world. Uh, third point about homogeneity between the lines of what you said. Indeed, one problem with um, using the expression V4 when it's uh, about uh, the negative part, so it's not only that it's not always the four countries together, 
It's also that can we regionalize political opinions? There are so many things lost. So when we say that the V4 is a region against Europe, which is a question, there are many political opinions, many political standpoints, many values, many ideas, many different kinds of people lost in it. And you are right, it's also true for the national level. So there are things to dig further. It's much more complex and we hear whether on the national or the regional level, we fall back into the myth of homogeneity, right? And then, why are nations constructed? That's an excellent question, and when, why are some constructions more successful than others? I think that economic failures don't explain everything. So, dissimulating economic failures or compensating economic shortcomings is not enough to explain why it's nationalism that seems to be um, winning and not other uh, types of identities like the socioeconomic ones that you mentioned. Why nations? Another reason is that nationalism was during communist times, so to speak, in incubation in the region. And now it's back. It wasn't gone, it wasn't fully smothered in some sort of incubation. And now we end up in a with a delayed form of nationalism, because while we were in incubation, at least on the nationalist level, many other people joined um, the concert of nations in the world through the process of decolonization. And so we are a bit delayed with that because many other things happened in terms of nation building in the world and outside, in the sense of outside of Europe. So still, why is the national construction so successful? Because a nation is a great novel. It's a great story. And by the way, great novels, you know those thick mandatory readings in high school from the 19th century are all closely related to um, nation building. It, these are great stories. And also, coming back to, to the global scene, they make sense. They are not necessarily true. There are many exaggerations. They are closer to novels than to reality sometimes. So that's why I use uh, the expression great novel. But they make sense. I'm not sure that on the global scene everything really makes sense. It's complex for sure. It doesn't necessarily make sense. And this would be a thing to think through, by the way, to uh, challenge the, the abuse of the nationalist narrative is that um, are or demagogues simplifying something that's complex but makes sense? Or is it not simplification? Is it just giving sense and meaning to something that doesn't necessarily have one? So I would say this is, these are the comments I would add to, to what you said. And just to finish, you make a generous use of the expression deconstruction. You use it quite a few times. Let me use another one just to relate what you said to the topic. It's about even when it comes to our greatest values, those that we cherish. So when it's about freedom, when it's about democracy, when it's about Europe, the idea is never to identify with these great things. The idea is to keep like a critical distance, a constructive distance, and this is something perhaps that didn't happen in the 90s and the early 2000s. So this Europeanizing process, I think we identified with Europe far too quickly and easily, and there was no constructive criticism, especially not on the left side, which might explain why the region or parts of it have fallen back into such Eurosceptic uh, uh, positions. So the idea is never to identify, don't identify with things. Keep some critical distance. Read your nationality and the history of your nation like a great novel. When you read a novel, you do as if it was true, otherwise you can't read it, but then sooner or later you close the book and, well, you know that there is truth in it, but basically it's fiction. So keep this critical distance. You call it deconstruction, let me call it avoid identifying even with the best things around because that's the way to 
improve them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We actually have to close, exactly, we have to close the first session. Um, so thanks again for your time and for the, the comments, and I think we want to put our heads together and think about what's next. And it's always good to have this exchange because you need the feedback because sometimes there's so much in the topic and in the subject that you just lose the view of things you might miss out and, um, and even the different levels and um, intensity with what you work on. So that was uh, very welcome, thanks very much. Just for your information, we have to close that session now for this uh, morning, that was the live part of the event. I uh, would, in, sorry, excuse me. I would invite you to join us in the afternoon online. I was told there is, might be a bit of a problem with the link because there are two links on the program and I think for the afternoon session you should use the first one the one which uh, is, uh, was actually made up for or done uh, uh, for the live event. So um, from my part, thanks very much for coming, for attending this event. Uh, and you know, it's very great to have the students here. And we hope that we're going to see us more often um, in the coming weeks and months. And I just hand over the mo uh, microphone to Adam for say goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.